Okay, the bells are ringing, our Angelus bells at six o'clock, so it's a good time. I just found out this week that a lot of people come in in the back from the back parking lot, but they, they don't come in these doors. They go way to the back to come in. So, and I said, well, why is that? And I said, well, they don't want to be seen, I think is the thing. So <laughs> that was the impression I got. So anyway, I'm glad to see you, whether it's through the back door or the front door, but I just never, I, I was, and I saw someone just, just do that. I don't know you guys did that. So I, they're coming in. Oh, they're not. They're going back. And then they came in the back door. So anyway, so Father uh, Karate is with us. I'm, I'm really excited about this week. And I, I know that he likes a group that's energetic. He commented to me today that um, you guys really, like when you say hello or good morning and it comes back or the Lord be with you and it comes back, it's uh, a sign of a good vibrant parish. And he's like, he was kind of really impressed by that and it was a little unusual in his experience. So very good. Um, so he's going to lead us in opening prayer here, but I just wanted to say uh, welcome. I hope you can always, and anybody, if you want to come to the 515 soup deal, it was good tonight and it'll be good tomorrow and you're always welcome to come to that and ask first, but you're also welcome to skip it, you know, because I know you're fasting because of the Lenten season and everything, so. Okay. All right. So let me hand it over to Father, and uh, we'll begin our mission talks. Good evening, good people. Good evening. Well, it took me at least five years to get the people of St. Olive's to respond like that. <laughs> but I did. I got them. Let's take a moment to... Um, Remember that we are in the presence of God. No matter where we are, no matter who we're with, God is always there. So I would invite you to close your eyes, go into the inner life, and just let go of all the concerns and distractions, as legit legitimate as they may be, and just Appreciate the inner peace for a moment. And so we pray. O oh God, who commanded us to listen to your beloved Son. Nourish us inwardly with your word of life. and Purify the eyes of our spirit, that we may rejoice in the sign of your glory. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Okay. A few disclaimers before we start. Uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you over the next three days uh, is my journey of faith. It's where I stand, how I understand God, how I understand church, how I understand the relationship that I have with God and with Christ. I am not teaching doctrine, okay? This is my opinion. And so, since it's my opinion, you certainly can disagree with me. But be prepared for a fight. <laughs> I think that's very important. You know, sometimes when we priests speak, people think, oh, that must be what the church believes. Eh, maybe not. Maybe it's a different way of looking at things. It doesn't conform to the ritual or conform to the formulas that we're accustomed with, uh, with in defining doctrine. I'm not going to teach heresy, I assure you of that. But I may express some things to you. You might step back and say, oh, I never heard of that. I wonder if that's right. Well, of course it's right. I said it. <laughs> so uh, take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, listen and internalize it and evaluate it. And if it's good for you, run with it. If it's not, let it die. Okay? Okay? I believe that every person in this 
community here has a great deal to offer about their faith. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a priest. You don't have to be a religious. You just have to be a disciple of Christ trying to follow the gospel message. And if we are all people of faith, then we can share that faith with each other and assist each other in understanding more deeply our relationship with God. So I value everything you bring to the table. And although I will never ask you to speak if you're not comfortable speaking, I hope you will respond by sharing your understanding of your relationship with God, because that could change the life of another person who's listening to you, okay? I would like to suggest that what we say here stays here. That we don't run out and say and tell our friends, do you know what Mary Smith said? Confidentiality, confidentiality breeds trust. And if we don't have trust, we're gonna keep our mouths shut. So let's be careful what we say. Let's try to keep our, comment, our people's comments here in this, in this assembly and respect them for that. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about discipleship. And I wanna start by asking you a question. I would like you to think of your closest friends. Maybe you have one very close friend. Maybe that friend is your spouse. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's someone you grew up with. But think about that person. Ask yourself the question, what are the, what is involved in that friendship? What components, parts is in that friendship? What do you need? How have you sustained that friendship maybe over many years? I remember people telling me that, that they had friends in, uh, that they grew up with and that every, every year they would get together and they would keep in communication. What are the things that keeps friendship alive? What do you have to do to be a good friend to somebody else? You understand what I'm asking? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Anybody have any thoughts on top of their heads? Or you want to take a moment? Yes. Trust and respect. What else? Yes. When you say give and take, you mean? Thank you. Listen. By the way, I taught for 25 years before I was ordained. I taught high school boys. I have great patience. I can sit here, stand here, and wait until you are ready to talk. <laughs> so, uh, spending time with. Please? Things in common. Yes. Support in time of need, yep. Sense of humor, very good. Bounce things off. Yep. Good listener. Not self -centered. Not self humble. Somebody had their hand up back here. Maybe not. I always thought friendship is like marriage. Okay. 
I know nothing about that. Father Tom. Knowing each other's story. Ah, yeah. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes. Right. To be together, to celebrate, to spend time, to know something about the person's background, to rely upon them. All of those things contribute to friendship. I want you to keep those thoughts in mind as we proceed. So in talking about discipleship, I want to start with baptism. How many in this congregation remember their baptism? Ah, we have one. Who else? You do. You do, you do, okay. I don't. And I would say most of us don't. I was born March 7th, 1943. My mother was as more Catholic than the Pope. <laughs> and so in those days, you had to be baptized within two weeks, right? Look, I see all these... People around my age is going like this. <laughs> and you know, in those days, you did what the church told you to do. So on the 24th of March, they brought me to the church and I was baptized exactly two weeks after I was born. And my mother wasn't there. Do you know why? No, she, she was out of the hospital. But she had to be churched. She had to be received back into the church after she had the baby. And I remember her coming to church. In those days, you remember the altar rails, huh? Kneeling at the altar rail and the priest coming out with his ritual book and babbling something in Latin. And she was back in the church. Now, I, don't, I never did ask her and I really haven't looked into it but it was called the Churching of Women. Did you ever hear that? Never heard of it. Anyways, uh, so my upbringing, you see, um, w was, was very, very, uh, shall we say, traditional. Um, but, it, but no matter whether it was traditional or modern or whatever, our journey of faith begins with baptism. And baptism puts us into a relationship with God and with the church. I am concerned about the relationship with God. Not that I want to ignore the church. The church is important. The community of faith is necessary in order to support us in this journey. We talk about grace. You know, I, I want to receive grace, right? You, you know what that means. But what is grace? Do you ever ask the question, what is grace? What do you think grace is? <laughs> I know you would know. <laughs> I always used to think of grace as some kind of a commodity, you know, like, uh, like uh, something you'd pour into a jug. Grace is the relationship that God gives to us. God reaches out and he touches us. And he says, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. Let's get together. Let's get together. Let's build on that relationship. I really think we have a hard time believing that we have a relationship with God. Do you find that? It's hard to believe, isn't it? As Father Tom prayed this, this morning, you love us even with all of our problems. Boy, that's hard. And so I would suggest to you the model of God in my mind <coughs> is parents. How many of you are parents? 
I can't put my hand up. <laughs> Notice what parents do, as I have observed them. I'll tell you one quick story. My, my sister Agnes, God rest her soul, um, who was the third of the four of us, I had two sons. One of them was, got involved with drugs and alcohol. And he really, really got down. And he would steal from his mother, you know, oh, you could, I'm sure you've heard all the stories. No matter what, my sister worked with that young man. Even sometimes when, when her, her, her sisters and brother would, would discourage her and say, oh, let him go. She never gave up on him. And I remember the day that I was home visiting them in New York. All my family lives on the, on the East Coast. And he had gone into recovery. And she said, do you want to go visit? Well, I said, of course I want to go visit. He was a totally different person. I almost cried. And to this day, he's, he's named after me. To this day, he never forgot that I was the only one of his uncle and aunts who came to visit and spend time with him. But parents do that, don't they? They never give up on their kids. And I've heard stories of, of, of parents whose kids have walked away, said, the hell with you. And yet, there's always that desire to be with, to reconcile, to be in the presence of. My point is this, that if we as human beings can have that kind of love and devotion, that is a, a small reflection of who God is. Because God created us put those things in our hearts. We're the little bit of it. He is the unconditional, huge parent in the sky, if you will. John, St. John tells us God is love. It's not an attribute. You know, we love. It's, a, it's an attribute. You know, we're not love. That's for sure, excuse me. God is love. The verb to be. God equals love. He cannot be anything else. Therefore, he is our friend. What do you think? Hard to believe? When you think about it, is it that hard to believe? Come on, come on. It's, it's, it's really not. Although, you know, I was raised as a kid <laughs> when God was certainly not my friend. You know, the big book in the sky, the good sisters used to tell us. And you better be sure that the, the good on one page and the bad on the other, and you come to the end of your life, you damn well better be sure that the good is longer than the bad. Or you know where you're going. God is judge, God is ogre, God is distant. And yet we look at the gospel and what do we see? The God man always loving, especially the broken, especially the ones who suffer. Who in this room is not broken in some way? I would, uh, ex I would, um, encourage you, if you're going to do any kind of prayer, do a special prayer doing this, during this season of Lent, to really think about God as, as parent, God as loving father, God as good friend. And that's not, that's not to deny the power and the majesty of God. I, I, I'm on a retreat team at uh, St. Anthony's a Marathon, and the last retreat we gave, I, I had that, this is, was part of my talk, and, and this very fine 
young man said, what? But God is so powerful and so awesome. And I said, yes, that's why he's our friend. Because he can make himself into anything he wants. He, 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 he doesn't want us to, to feel the power. He wants us to feel the love. If you look at the, the New Testament, the, the Christian scriptures, it's all over the place. It's all over the place. Okay? All right? Yes. Any, any thoughts? Any? Well, I mean, I, I, I think... Well, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that God is present in all of those situations. I'm not saying God isn't. But baptism puts us into a unique relationship. And that relationship, I think, um, is not any better or any worse than any other relationship. But it marks us as, as followers of Christ. That is what baptism, I think, does. It says... This is a person who wants to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, I, I don't think that I thought that when I was a, you know, two weeks old. But, I, but, but that's why in our catechetical programs, we have to begin to tell young people that, it, that they have to make a choice. You can take a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. You can baptize all the babies in the world. But if we don't help them to understand that the baptism was the beginning of the journey made of the contact and the relationship, called us to be disciples and work in the ministry of Christ, we don't help them to see that. We don't help people to see that at some point you have to say, I want to be part of the ministry of Christ. I want to be a follower. Now, I think the fact, for example, that, that you are all here and, and as, I, as I experienced this weekend, you know, m many people coming to church, we may not say it out loud, but we say it by our actions. How we worship, how we serve. I'm amazed at every event I went to this weekend, there were people with food. I mean, you know, this morning I came and there was this big egg dish. I mean, the generosity is, 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 is very important. It's feeding. It's hospitality. It's modeling what we need to do when we leave these doors. And I'll talk more about mission when, when we get to that in the, in the program. But that's what I mean. Um, you know, uh, God is bigger than religion. Let me put it that way. And, and I agree with you. But I was baptized, and at some point in my life, I said, this is somebody I want to follow. This is a mission I want to be part of. And it wasn't because they, you know, the bishop put his hands on my head and said whatever he said. Um, I, I felt that a long time before that. Um, we have to make a choice at some point that baptism, we're okay with our baptism and that we want to build on that baptism and we want to build on that relationship with, with God. Does it make sense? Not, nothing is automatic. Nothing is automatic. It's choice. Remember, we all have freedom. The great gift God has given us and the great curse that God has given us is freedom. And we have to use it. And we have to make the best of that freedom for others as well as for ourselves. Okay? Anybody else got a, a comment that they would like to make? Okay. You had your chance. <laughs> now, let me see. Um, Christine, where's the down arrow? <laughs> I, 
I'm, a, I'm an Apple person. <laughs> so I have, I have no use for this Mac, Microsoft stuff. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Okay, we did all that. So, um, James Martin wrote a book called Learning to Pray. And, and I would highly recommend it. James Martin is a Jesuit. Um, and the good thing about the book is it's readable. And it's, um, it, it, it presents all kinds of different ways of praying. But in the beginning, he um, proposes that as we began with our reflection, that we uh, have a friendship with God and that God has a friendship with us. And he, he talks about what that looks like. And I've listed the six elements that he talks about. And I just want to kind of walk through those uh, with you. Because you've said some of this already. Time. We have to spend time with our friend. How do we spend time with God? How do we spend time with God? What kind of prayer? Just talk. That's the point. It is the ability to share with God my inner life, my problems, my joys, my sorrows, my frustrations, I had a, 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 a person I was seeing for spiritual direction one time come and we're talking about prayer and she said, oh, you know, uh, Father, I, I, I would like to scream at God. I said, well, why not? And she said, oh, I can't do that. I said, I want you to read the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, they're always screaming at God about this, that, or the other thing. God wants us to be who we are. When we spend time with God, we share our inner life, we share who we are, we are able to say, even though he knows, obviously, but you know if you have an issue in your life, if you can share it with somebody, it, it makes it easier. It brings it out. We can look at it and deal with it. So scream at God if that is what you're feeling. He's pretty, got pretty broad shoulders. I think he can handle it. And spend time. One of the most difficult things to do is to discipline oneself to say, every day I'm going to spend X amount of time in prayer. Because you know what happens, don't you? The phone rings. I got to take care of this. I got to take care of that. It's a struggle. And you, you, you know, you may, it may work for a month. And all of a sudden, you fall off the bike. Well, get back on the bike. None of us are perfect. If we keep at it, eventually, it will be so wonderful. We will be so satisfied by that time that it will make it easier. Spend time with God. It is absolutely essential if we're going to build that friendship. Learning, and I, I think uh, somebody mentioned that, huh? We want to learn about our friend. How do we learn about God? Where do we find material to learn about God? All right, in church is one place. The scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Present us with who this person is that we call the God-man. And so I believe that, I really believe that a healthy spirituality is grounded in frequent reflection on the scriptures. If, if not every day, often. 
in our, in our life, in our week or in our month. I've been fortunate enough since I've retired to be able to get up in the morning and I always reflect on the readings from the Mass of the day. Um, and I would recommend to you worship, um, America Magazine has um, a column called uh, the, the, the Word. And it's about, it's on, always a commentary on scripture. Uh, America Magazine sends out every morning a reflection on the readings of the day. Uh, you can go on America, American, uh, americamagazine.org and you can subscribe to that, it's free. But it, it's more material to help us to reflect, um, to help us to reflect on who that Jesus is. Um, the third is honesty. To be honest with God, to let God in, to share everything with him. The good points and the bad points, the failures and the, and the triumphs, the moods and the angers, to lay it before him. He's a good friend. He'll support you as you work through it. Listening, someone mentioned listening. I think it is really hard for us as Americans to listen. It's hard for anybody, but I think we have a tremendous amount of distractions in our, in our culture. Um, I used to notice that when I'd be presiding at mass, um, sometimes um, 20 minutes, half hour, all of a sudden people are getting restless because it's time to get up and get popcorn <laughs> and go back to TV, you know? It's just the way it's built. It's the way we're built. Uh, you know, uh, television, they're smart. They know 15 minutes and you have a commercial. And what do you do? You get up and you go get popcorn or whatever. <laughs> and, and that's kind of built into us. We, we don't have, we, we lose that sense of, of stick to itiveness. Um, and so we need very much, I think, um, to take time hmm? and to, um, to listen, to listen, to listen. You might say to me, well, how can I listen to God? <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. If you say you're listening to God and you hear whisperings in your ear, go see your psychiatrist. <laughs> it's not what I mean. You can listen by paying attention to what's going on inside you. What are the feelings? Do you get words popping into your head? Do you have memories? Do you have ideas? All of a sudden they're there. That's God speaking. You know, uh, Father Tom asked me several months ago to prepare to give these presentations. And um, I, uh, I did, in my prayer, I said, you know, Lord, what do you want, what do you, what do you want to say to your people? I said, not about me, as much as I'd like it to be. <laughs> it's about your people that you love. So what do you want me to say? What should I talk about? What do you think they might need in their spirituality? And I prayed for about a week about this. Every day I'd ask him, oh, nothing happened. Well, one day I was doing my centering prayer and it finished. I finished and I was sitting in silence and the word discipleship jumped into my head. Now, where did that come from? I took that as, a, a, as an answer to my prayer. And that's why I'm talking about discipleship. So listening is more than, listening is paying attention without distraction to what's going on in our lives. And when we're praying, what's going on inside? What are the thoughts? What are the feelings? What are the emotions? This is all God speaking to us. All God speaking to us. So listen, listen carefully. 
because he wants so much to speak with us. Let's see what my notes have to say here. Yeah, I'm right. <laughs> I think also um, change is very important. <laughs> oh, gosh. This is a hard topic, isn't it? Um, I'll, I'll tell you what I experienced in my own life. Um, I had, I've had over the years a very, I wouldn't say profound, a very progressive change in how I understand God. When I was younger, when I was in my 20s, um, I was afraid of God. God was the, you know, the, the uh, ogre in the room who was out to get me, product of my education and of my upbringing. And I remember when I was about 26, I was a, uh, I, before I was ordained, I was a religious brother for 25 years, and, and our mission was uh, teaching. And we always took a annual retreat. So I was doing my first Ignatian retreat. And um, it's eight days of absolute silence. <laughs> and each day you go to your director and he gives you three scripture quotes. And you have to pray three hours, one for each of those quotes, a whole hour. Well, I thought to myself, this is really ridiculous. This is impossible. By the third day, I was praying more than an hour with one scripture quote. Anyways, towards the end of the retreat, I had a particular um, intuition, shall I say. And I concluded from that that the God that I really believe in or the God that believes in me, maybe is a better way to put it, doesn't really care about my mistakes and my sins. All he cares about is that I grow in my love for him and in my service to his people. That lifted a tremendous weight off me and began to tell me that this being that we call God is truly a God of love. And it changed the entire way that I did my ministry. I used to be a pretty tough teacher. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> <clears throat> and I would take nothing from anybody. <clears throat> Any kid didn't have his homework, God helped them. I, um, I taught in Queens. Anybody know where Queens is? New York City. And the kids would take the subway because they came from, you know, different places. <laughs> and they'd inevitably tell you, oh, brother. I was a brother then. Oh, brother. My, I was looking at my homework and it fell in the tracks in the subway. I said, oh, baloney. <laughs> I'll see you at 3 o'clock. Kids were really afraid of me. But what I came to understand after that, not right away, but with some along the journey, is that my job was not to scare them, to make them do homework. My job was to help them to grow as persons, to be good students, using their good talents. And I became much more interested in helping them to do that then really, even in teaching, I was teaching history. Can you imagine history to ninth graders? 45 of them? Um, the experience I had in retreat softened my heart. It opened me up to people. Not the doing, but the helping. Which is what taking care of the neighbor means. It means so wanting to help the other to become fully who they are. That's love. That's love. And so um, that retreat, that change has come. 
And it's, it's gotten deeper and deeper over the years. And so I think you move away from God as judge to God as my friend who loves me and who wants to be with me, and so I want to be with him. Thoughts about the image of God? Anybody want to share anything about that? Don't all talk at once. We've only got four more minutes. Oh. Okay. I will continue. I just thought, I just thought, a lot of people I met have come from like what you say, that they grew up with God and they moved toward mercy. Right. Ah. Yes. No, I think you're right, Father Tom, because uh, I've spoken with people um, not of my generation, but later on, you know, uh, what they call them, baby boomers and beyond. They don't have that problem. I was talking with. Um, Ah, uh, Father Conopo one time. In fact, I was doing a mission at St. Olaf's after I retired. He asked me to come back. After I went to the hospital, I mean. Anyway, so, <laughs> so you know, I was talking about what I was going to do, and I talked about, you know, the ogre god, just like you. He said, that was never my experience. I was overwhelmed. Uh, and as I look around at this group, you know, we're a lot older than you are. And I think that's true. I think it's how the church presented the concept of God that really made a difference. So if I continue to do these talks and we get younger people, I gotta change my script. <laughs> but I think you're absolutely right. You've hit it right. I think you're right about that. I think that's very true. Our upbringing is, is, you know, so dynamic and it, it ingrains in us it's so many uh, ways of thinking, you know, they call them the tapes, you know, the old tapes running in your head. Uh, I, <laughs> God rest my good mother. The job is worth doing. It's worth doing well. She would say to me after I had scrubbed the kitchen floor. She wasn't happy with it. But, you know, that sticks in your head. And those tapes keep running and running and running. Uh, so I think that's true. Um, and I think, I think when, you, when your image of God changes, your understanding of religion changes too. You, you know, you, you begin to see that religion is important. My, my community of faith is important. But God is bigger than that. God is independent of that. God can do what God wants. Not what I think God should do. I wouldn't have said that when I was younger. You know, we were taught that everything comes through the church. No salvation outside the church. Um, and of course, that is not um, healthy or good. And the last thing is silence. <laughs> How are you doing on silence? Um, you know, I think um, in my own life, silence has become very important. But it's not easy at all. And what, what I mean by silence, it's not the silence around me. It's the silence within me, in my head. You know, there's, there's a, a form of prayer called centering prayer in which you sit for 20 minutes in silence. And immediately when you start it, the babbling goes on in the head. And so there's a process that you follow to 
to let that go. But I've been doing that prayer probably for 10, 15 years. And it does get a little easier. But it's constantly letting go of all the babbling that goes on in our heads. It's really living in the present moment. I've learned as I've got older, because I think when you get older, at least in my experience, you have to be careful where you walk, how you walk. You've got to pay attention to what you're doing. I think when you're younger, you can do five things at once. But when you get older, you do, start doing two or three things, and you might, you might hurt yourself. You might fall. I've learned to pay attention to what I'm doing right now. Not to be thinking about what comes next. But what's happening now? How am I feeling? What is, what is my heart saying as I'm doing this particular activity? And the silence helps us to come to that. So if you're not trying to live, uh, not trying a time, from time to time to be in silence, it's something that might be helpful in trying to continue our friendship with, with God. Um, so, so try it. Try it. And tell me how you do. Uh, so, um, once again, <laughs> uh, Lord have mercy, you poor old man. Uh, here it is. I got it. All right. Baptism, discipleship is built on, on the, our baptism in Christ. We decide at some point that we want to do for Christ in the world. We come to understand it's not about just going to church on Sunday. It's about doing something with what happens at church. And so we, um, we respond to Christ in the world and in our community. Discipleship is a growing intimacy with God as the foundation and the motivation for why I want to reach out in support of others in need. And the best place to find out what discipleship is about is to constantly and consistently read the Bible, read the New Testament particularly, because we see there Christ values, how Christ operates. And uh, the third day of our, of our mission, I'm going to hopefully give us an opportunity to see how that works in an exercise that I have developed because I think it's, it's, that's so crucial and so important that um, I'd like us to, to share some time in doing that. Um, and I think, um, okay, we're not gonna, we're gonna stop here. So what, your homework, if you're coming back tomorrow, you might have nobody here tomorrow after today, <laughs> is to look at Luke 10, uh, verses 1 to 12. Luke 10, 1 to 12. Take a look at that. Read it over. See what it says to you about discipleship. Okay? I don't know if you're going to do it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to check homework tomorrow. <laughs> well, there are no tracks in Chippewa in Eau Claire. <laughs> gotcha. Let us, uh, let us bring our... Are there any questions, comments, thoughts, reflections, things you want to say, your crazy father? Anybody got something to say? Yes, ma'am.
Yes. Exactly. It does. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And it sticks with you a long time. It does. Um, I, I, you know, and you look at the Old Testament, and well, like you said, you know, but remember, no matter how crazy those Hebrews were. God always forgave them, and he always took care of them. Now, in the, the, the stories and the language is put off-putting sometimes, but that's always the case, which is why I always tell people, um, not that you should ignore the Hebrew scriptures, but focus on the New Testament. Focus on and look at Christ. Observe what he does. And that's God. God is the face of, or Christ is the face of God. And I think that helps to get you over that, you know, kind of thing. Any other, yes, sir. I understand. I think it's... I, I understand what you're saying, but what I would suggest to you is don't be frenetic. In other words, accept yourself as you are. Do the best you can and rely on God. Because no matter how we feel, God feels better about us than we feel about ourselves. You see what I'm saying? I don't, you know, I sometimes find prayer a work. You know, I'll get up in the morning, I'll say, oh, I think I'd rather take a ride to the cities and do some shopping at Trader Joe, you know? <laughs> but I don't. But it's still an effort. I don't see it as work. I see it as making an effort. And if I really, really think Jesus and God is my friend, then it's a joy because I'm connecting with my friend. Make any sense? Okay. Last call. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, I may be giving you a permission, but you already have it. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's one of my biggest frustrations as a priest. A lot of really good people that I have met and worked with have an externalist view of the church. It's all about keeping the rules and doing what Father tells me. Pray, stay, and obey. And that's hard for me because that's not how I see the church. I see the church as that community that supports me in my journey towards God. And exactly what you're saying is, is what I hope will come across. We have a relationship. He loves us. And, he lo and we have to love him back if that relationship is to survive. That's why I talked about friendship. Thank you for... That one comment makes it all worth it for me. All right. Let us take a moment to sit up in our places, to put our hands down on our sides, put our feet flat on the floor. Take a deep breath. Gently close your eyes and be in silence.
we pray together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you very much. Really? <laughs>